in this video we will start talking about the last unit in our course the input output devices so here is a quick summary of some of the important questions that we want to answer in this discussion so we will see how the io hardware influences the operating system so note that the io devices like the hard disk the keyboard the mouse they are all very different from the cpu also there are several different types of io devices and each of these devices are very different from each other so we will see how uh, the operating system accommodates so many different types of uh, io devices then we will see what io services the operating system provides in order to access a wide range of uh, io devices so here we will see there are certain generic operations and generic services that the operating systems provide in order to enable a broad range of uh, io device access we will briefly talk about how the operating system implements these services so here we will touch upon the device drivers uh, we will see that device drivers are basically that part of the uh, operating system which is responsible for directly communicating or talking to the um, io device hardware there are certain generic principles that are used for implementing these uh, device drivers we'll uh, talk about those as well and finally we'll see how the operating system can improve the performance of uh, input output so note that most of the io devices are extremely slow as compared to the cpu so the keyboard the mouse they are very slow when compared to the cpu clock speeds therefore we cannot allow the cpu to directly communicate with these slow io devices it will waste a lot of cpu's time and therefore there are certain generic uh, optimizations some techniques that are provided by the operating systems to make this communication more efficient and faster so we'll talk about those as well here all right so let's begin our discussion with the architecture of uh, the io subsystem so for that recall the architecture of the of a basic computer system so we had the cpu then we had let's say ram or the main memory and then there were a bunch of uh, io devices for example the hard disk and then let's say a monitor or a screen and and all of these were connected with the help of a system bus so this is the basic system architecture that we uh, talked about recall the system bus is that component uh, of our uh, computer system which allows all the other components to talk to each other so we still have a system bus in this uh, io uh, subsystem architecture but now that now the main difference we will see in the, on the subsequent slides is that there are several different io devices that are connected to the system bus so the focus is more on the io devices besides in general even the simplest io devices have an abstraction called the device port the port is essentially a set of registers that the machine uses to send data to and from the device so think of these registers on the device itself there are four such basic registers that are mentioned here on the slide so we have the status register the control register data in register and data out register the status register tells the cpu about the status of the device so for example whether the device is busy right now is it idle or is it in some kind of error state or maybe the data which the cpu had requested is is it ready to take and so forth the control register is used by the cpu to write the command that the cpu wants the device to execute or perform so for example read and write commands can go here command is essentially a byte basically a sequence of zeros and ones the value of the byte is interpreted by the device the data in register contains any data that needs to be sent from the io device to the cpu the data out register will contain any data that we want to send from the cpu into the device so if the cpu wants to write some data into the device that will be written into the data out register here is a very simple example to illustrate the working of these uh, four registers let's say the cpu wants to write 123 this number inside an io device so in this case the cpu will first check the status register let's say the current status of this io device is idle it's not doing anything 
Therefore, the CPU will proceed to write the command into the control register. Now, in this case, the CPU wants to write. So, it will say write in the control register. And the CPU wants to write the value 123. So, data in recall is used for uh, data that is sent from the device to the CPU. In this case, there is nothing that the CPU is trying to read. So, there is, so we are not going to do anything with the data in register. But for the data out register, here we will write the number 123 that we want to write inside the I.O. device. So, with that, now there are some more steps that I have skipped over here. So, for example, the CPU will need to, uh, once the CPU has written the command here in the control register, uh, it will change the status of the device to indicate uh, that command is ready. So, and, and then once the IO device is, detects that the command is ready, it can then uh, start working on this command by changing this status to busy. So, there are some more details here, but I hope this example illustrates how these uh, different registers are used uh, to uh, by the IO device to perform read and write operations. In addition to these registers, the IO devices also have a controller think of this controller the IO controller as the brain of the IO device the IO controller is responsible for receiving the commands from the CPU via the system bus and translating these commands into device specific actions so for example reads and writes of data uh, inside the IO device and also onto the system bus now here are several examples of the IO devices uh, first, uh, there are several traditional I.O. devices which I am sure most of you would have heard about. So, the hard disks, the printer, the keyboard, modem, mouse, our uh, screens, the monitors, uh, touch screens or, or not, they are all examples of traditional I.O. devices. Then there are also several non-traditional I.O. devices which we do not come across in our uh, daily life, but uh, most of these we do not come across uh, directly in our daily life. Nevertheless, these are also uh, I.O. devices. So joysticks, robot actuators, uh, flying surface of an airplane, fuel injection system of a car or any other sophisticated machine. These are all uh, non-traditional I.O. devices. Here is the system architecture that I was alluding to on the previous slide. Note that this is our CPU, we have the main memory, the cache, uh, and then there are several different I.O. devices. For example, we have the monitors, we have so many disks here, the keyboard and so forth. And all of these several components, they are connected using this bus, which is uh, the PCI bus in this case. This is the system bus. The PCI basically is an acronym for Peripheral Component Interconnect. That's the system bus. There are several important points here that I would like to highlight here. So let's start with this processor memory sub subsystem uh, in this portion. So note that uh, the, the processor, the CPU, the cache, the main memory, these are all connected with the bus and then there, this is the memory controller over here. Uh, one thing that you need to realize is um, typically the CPU and the main memory, these they are connected with a much higher speed bus. And therefore, uh, 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 so th that bus is basically, uh, it has a higher speed as compared to the system bus, the PCI bus. And that's why there is a bridge over here uh, which connects this faster bus, this faster subsystem with this slower system bus. So think of this bridge as a hub. Now here we have this IDE interface. So IDE stands for Integrated Device Electronics. Uh, basically it's an interface for mass storage devices in which the controller is integrated onto the disk drive itself. So for example, uh, the CD-ROM. Okay, so the CD-ROM drive. Then we have this SCSI controller over here. SCSI stands for Small Computer System Interface. Now this is a parallel interface standard that was developed by ANSI. ANSI is basically American National Standards Institute. It is used for attaching printers, disk drives, scanners and other such uh, peripherals to the computers. So this is the SCSI controller and note that it has a bus of its own over here uh, so that it can attach several disks and this controller can then control all of these disks.
if you have a computer with PCI bus with additional slots then you can also plug in some additional devices there so typical PCI cards that are used in the PCs they include uh, network cards sound cards modems and and some extra ports TV tuner cards uh, disk controllers and so forth in this picture over here we see that the processor memory subsystem is connected to relatively fast IO devices via the PCI bus. So for example, the monitor, the hard disk, these are, uh, these are all examples of relatively fast IO devices. But if you want to connect to much slower IO devices, for example, keyboard, then in here an expansion bus interface is used. So this expansion bus is used for connecting to uh, even slower IO devices, for example, keyboard, and parallel and, and serial ports and so forth so that is a quick <coughs> summary of this um, pci bus architecture uh, one thing that you should keep in mind as we move along is uh, corresponding to every io device there is an io device controller so this controller is responsible uh, for interacting with the device it is also the brain of the io device it has the ability to interpret the commands that are sent to the device and instruct the device to execute them so keep this uh, picture and the, these messages in mind as we go along that was the hardware view of the io devices here is the operating systems view of how it sees the io devices the boxes at the very bottom these boxes over here these are the devices that are actually connected to the machine for instance, we have this keyboard, mouse, uh, we may have some uh, USB devices, some hard disk and so on. Now, each device is connected to a controller. So keyboard has a keyboard controller, mouse has a mouse device controller and so on. This is the so uh, hardware side of the things. Like, so so this uh, everything below this line, this is hardware. Everything above this line, that's the software. The piece of the software that interacts directly with the hardware of the IO device is known as a device driver. So for instance, uh, this is the device driver of the keyboard that interacts with the keyboard hardware. Every device has one. So we have the mouse device driver and similarly all other devices over here, they have their own device drivers. Essentially, the device driver is that part of the operating system which understands the specific hardware details of the device, the IO device the operating system kernel itself that is abstracted out of the hardware specifics of the io devices so for instance there might be a network card attached to the computer now this network card could be coming from one of several possible vendors but this level of detail is not known to the kernel itself the low level hardware details these are dealt with by the specific device drivers of the IO devices. Similarly, there could be 10 different types of keyboards and it is possible that some keyboards require their own device drivers. But once again, uh, for the operating system kernel, the keyboard is a keyboard. The low level hardware specific details, those are dealt with by the corresponding device driver of the keyboard. Above the device drivers, we have this kernel I.O. subsystem. Now the kernel I.O. subsystem, it, it typically generates generic I.O. commands. For example, generic read, write commands. These generic read, write commands are handed down to the device drivers. And then it is the responsibility of the device driver to translate this generic read, write into the device specific read or write command which the IO device can understand and work upon. So for example, let's say the user application is trying to read some data from the hard disk. So the, so the user issues a, a generic read command and let's say the system call coming from the kernel also uh, is a generic read command, which is eventually handed down uh, to the respective device driver. Now depending upon whether the hard disk is an SSD or is it a magnetic hard disk the actual read command that needs to be delivered to the hard disk will change so for example if the file is stored in an ssd you typically need to tell the block number that needs to be read as opposed to this if the file is stored on a magnetic disk then 
to read the data from the magnetic disk you also have to tell the magnetic disk uh, uh, what uh, cylinder what sector what platter you are trying to read however the kernel itself is not involved in these low level details these low level details are dealt with by the device drivers the next thing we want to understand is how does the cpu give commands to a controller to accomplish the io transfer now we have seen that these controllers have uh, a few data and control registers and the cpu communicates with the controller by reading and writing into these registers still there are a few things to understand here so first is there are so many io devices connected to the computer at any point in time and all of these io devices will have their own uh, control and data registers so how does the cpu distinguish between these several IO devices and their registers. This is where the addresses come in. Every device, every IO device in the system is accessed through an address. Each device has a unique address and that is the address we will use to communicate with the device. Typically, each type of device has a reserved address range for it. This table over here shows the usual IO port addresses for our personal computers. So for instance, a timer will typically get an address in the range 040 to 043. This is hexadecimal range. Similarly, a game controller will get address in the hexadecimal range 200 to 20F. A graphics controller will similarly get an address in, in this range 3D0 through 3DF and so forth. Once we have these addresses, one possible way for the CPU or the operating system to communicate with the IO devices is by using some special IO instructions that will specify the amount of data that we want to transfer to a certain IO port address. Let's take an example. Let's assume we have this IO device and inside this IO device we have uh, let's say we have this status register and we also have let's say this data register. Let's assume the address of this status register is let's say hexadecimal 64. Let's say the address of this data register is hexadecimal 60. Now if we want to read and write into these uh, uh, registers, the status register and this uh, data register, we can use certain special input output instructions that are provided by the architecture to do that. So for instance, um, if we want to read the current st uh, content of this status register we may have we may use let's say we have an instruction i and b now i'm making this up let's say this is uh, going to read one byte of data from the status register into register r1 so we'll specify the instruction the destination register where we want to get the value and then the address of this uh, status register which is hexadecimal 64. similarly if you want to write something into this data register so we can use let's say the out instruction let's say you want to write one byte so we'll say out b r1 uh, and you want to write into let's say hexadecimal 60. so by using these special io instructions provided by the architecture we can communicate with the uh, input output devices another possible way of communicating with the io devices is with what is known as the memory mapped io if the io device supports memory mapped io then the device control registers of the uh, of the IO device are mapped into the address space of the CPU. Once this is done, if the CPU wants to communicate with the IO device, it only needs to read and write into the corresponding memory addresses. And these reads and writes done into the memory addresses, they automatically are translated into reads and writes or into the device registers. For instance, let's assume this is our ram or the physical memory and let's say here are certain addresses that are reserved for the io devices and we have this bunch of io devices let's say this is the hard disk then we have let's say this is the keyboard and then we have this monitor or the screen and corresponding to each of the io device we have this uh, io controller Let's assume that this range of addresses here, this is reserved for the hard disk. 
Similarly, this range of addresses here, this is reserved for keyboard. And finally, this range is reserved for our screen. If the CPU does any reads or writes into this region of addresses that is reserved for the hard disk, these would automatically be translated into reads and writes in the device registers corresponding to the hard disk. Similarly, if the CPU does any read or write into this range of addresses that is reserved for the keyboard, these would translate into reads and writes into the device control registers of the keyboard and so forth. Note that when CPU is writing into these uh, addresses in the memory, it is using the usual load word or store word instructions which are used for reading and writing into the memory. In this case, if you have the memory mapped IO, you do not need the special IO instructions. For example, the in B or the out B instructions that we talked about in the last uh, slide, these are not needed in the memory mapped IO. So having talked about the IO instructions and the memory mapped IO, you may wonder which of these two techniques is used in practice by the computers to communicate with the IO devices. So well, the answer really is both. Uh, our computers have used uh, IO instructions to control some devices and memory mapped IO to control others. So both are used. Memory mapped IO is especially effective when hundreds of thousands of reads and writes are required. For example, in case of graphics controller, so typically a graphics controller has a large memory mapped region to hold the screen contents. So to generate an image onto the screen, we simply need to output uh, by writing data into this memory mapped region. Once that is done, the controller will generate the screen image based on the contents of this memory mapped region. So this is a simple technique. It is a simple thing to use. And especially in this case, writing millions of bytes to the graphics memory is faster than issuing millions of input output instructions. Given that background, uh, we will now see how the device drivers might communicate with the IO devices. So we have talked about ports, port addresses. That is all pretty low level of detail. So most operating systems will provide a higher level abstraction to access the IO devices. For example, if you are writing a program to access the printer, you don't want to deal with the low level details of finding the port address uh, for the printer and going from there. Fortunately, the operating systems provide much higher level abstractions for us to deal with these IO devices. There are many ways to provide this abstraction. One particular way that is adopted by the Unix and Linux based operating systems uh, is to use the abstract, the file abstraction to access the IO devices. Essentially, on the Unix operating systems, corresponding to every IO device that is connected to the system, there is a file in the slash dev directory. So if you want to read and write into a certain IO device, we can simply open the file corresponding to that IO device and read and write into that file. Internally, the reads and writes that we are doing to the file would be translated by the operating system into reads and writes into the, IO, the corresponding IO device. This is an example of one of the things that operating systems do to provide a convenient access to the IO devices for the users. This description is pretty simple. Uh, however, there are many things that are happening in the background. So obviously you cannot just read and start reading and writing into any uh, IO device. You, you need to have the permissions. So there is access control going on in the background. The other thing is uh, the operating system will also make sure that the operations you're trying to do for a certain IO device are uh, reasonable or legitimate. For instance, if you start writing into a keyboard, that is not uh, expected. So that's another thing that the operating system is doing. Device allocation is also done by the operating system. Device allocation is the assignment of input output devices to various processes so that they can complete their tasks. To facilitate efficient communication with these IO devices, which are usually pretty slow as compared to the CPU, uh, 
Operating systems provide several additional services, for example, buffering, caching, spooling. We will talk in much more details about some of these techniques later on in this unit. So I'm not going to spend time on it right now. If there are many read write requests from several different processes for a given IO device, then IO scheduling may be required. So for instance, you, if the system has one hard disk and let's say uh, 30 different processes are trying to read and write into several different files into this one hard disk from this one hard disk then it is uh, the job of the IO scheduler to determine in what order these several reads and writes are serviced from the hard disk if the hard disks firmware has uh, some kind of a scheduling algorithm that can be used if not then the operating systems uh, IO scheduler is used to figure this out Error handling and failure recovery are also provided by the operating system. So, for example, let's say certain sec if certain blocks of a disk uh, get corrupted, assuming there is redundancy in the storage. So, if uh, assuming that there is uh, error correction codes in use, there is extra data that is stored. The operating system will try to recover the data if possible. This is a simple example of error handling and recovery. So these are several generic services that are pretty much uh, relevant to a broad range of IO devices. But if there are certain peculiar, unique uh, kind of uh, device specific services that are needed, those are implemented by the operating systems in the device drivers. With that background, we are now ready to start talking about how the device drivers can actually communicate with the IO devices. We will start our discussion by the simplest such communication paradigm used by the device drivers, which is known as polling. Let's take an example uh, to understand this better. Let's assume that we have an IO device uh, and it has the four basic registers that we talked about. So it has the status register, the control register, the data in and the data out registers as shown here. This is all inside our IO device. So this is our IO device. For the sake of this example, we'll assume that the CPU wants to write these 100 numbers inside this IO device. So it wants to write, let's say 100 followed by 99, 98 and all the way up to 1. So the CPU will start with the first number which is 100. When I say that CPU is wants to write this data inside the uh, IO device, essentially the CPU is going to use the device driver to do this task. So think of the device driver as a piece of code in the kernel, which is used to communicate with the IO device. So whenever I say that the CPU is doing this or CPU is doing that, essentially it, it is CPU that is running the device driver code to do or accomplish that task. Next, let's see how this value 100 can be written inside the device. Let's assume that the status of this device currently is busy. So that the device is doing something, it is busy doing something. So uh, the, the CPU or the device driver will first check the status of this device and it will find that the device is busy. So in polling, if the device is busy, essentially the device driver will wait for this device to become available or idle so essentially the you can think of this as waiting inside a while loop so while your device is busy uh, your uh, I, your device driver is simply waiting for this device to become available or to become idle so after some time let's say the IO device finishes whatever it was doing so its status changes from busy to let's say idle now the IO device I'm sorry the device driver can proceed with its uh, write request in this case the cpu wants to write this value 100 inside the io device so essentially the in, inside the control register which is also known as the command register the cpu will write the command it wants the io device to execute which in this case is write so the cpu will write this write command in the control register and the data that it wants this io device to write inside its memory is 100 so that data this value 100 would be written in the data out register once the cpu has set up the control register and the data out register it will then change the status of this device from idle to command ready 
So command ready basically means that the parameters the which are needed for executing this task have been set up. When the I/O device, the I/O controller, it uh, detects that the status is command ready, it will then start working on this command. So essentially, before doing that, it will change the status to again busy to indicate that it is now going to work on this command that the CPU has set up. While the I/O device is working on writing this data 100 in its internal memory, the device driver will again continue checking. Uh, inside this while loop it will again continue checking the status of this uh, IO device and it will wait for it to become available again so that it can proceed with writing these other data items after some time when the writing is done the IO device let's assume there was no error so the IO device will again change its status from busy to idle and uh, when the device driver detects that the uh, IO device is idle there was no error then it will proceed with writing the next data item which is 99 in exactly the same fashion it will again set up the command register with the right command the next data item that it wants to write now would be 99 not 100 and this process will, will repeat for every byte that the uh, CPU wants to write into this IO device this is how communication with IO devices work with polling the name polling of this communication protocol derives from the fact that in this communication uh, paradigm the device driver keeps checking this uh, keeps reading this busy bit in the status register until it becomes clear so essentially the host is busy waiting or polling steps involved in IO communication using polling are also summarized over here before closing the page on this uh, protocol let's quickly think about the pros and cons of this approach if the io device and the io controller that the cpu is communicating with they are very fast then this polling mechanism is a reasonable way to do things also if the data that the io device is, is generating for some reason it has to be handled very promptly for example if the data is coming from the keyboard or from a modem let's say for some reason the io device cannot hold the data for long it doesn't have enough buffer or for some other reasons it's uh, there is a deadline to handle the data quickly in in such scenarios also using polling is an excellent choice because the cpu is continuously waiting for the io device as soon as the data becomes available the cpu would know and it can uh, grab the data from there however what if the IO device that the CPU is communicating with is extremely slow as compared to the CPU? In this case, the CPU will end up wasting a lot of time waiting on the status register of the IO device for it to become idle or available. So that is the main drawback of polling based communication. So there are two important problems in the polling based communication. The first is that we are reading and writing only one byte at a time or one word at a time and the second important problem here is the busy wait in polling essentially every word or every byte that we are reading or writing from the IO device for that we will have to repeat this process of busy waiting onto the IO device its status register and then again setting it up and then waiting for the IO device to finish which is clearly very wasteful of the CPU's time if the IO device is slow with respect to the CPU so how can we fix this in the next video we will go over a technique called interrupt driven io which will help us fix some of these problems that's it for now stay tuned for the next video thank you